In this lecture, we will uh, discuss a poem, a, a rather long poem of 1,200 verses by a Fulani or, or Pul poet named Mamadou Aliutiam on the life of El Hajj Omar Tal, who was the Tukuler Fulani jihadist in the 19th century, who brought Tijani Islam, uh, the Tijani Sufi Brotherhood, to, uh, to uh, much of West Africa. It was already there in, in, in pockets, in very small uh, measure, but he was the one who was largely responsible for spreading uh, this particular interpretation of Islam throughout the Sahel region in West Africa, especially in Senegal and Mali, but in other places as well. Now, uh, uh, Tiam, the author of this uh, poem, which is an ode to the life of El Haj Omar, was a, uh, a foot soldier in El Haj Omar's army. And so we, it's, it's not only is it a very interesting poem, uh, it's also a poem that is told from the perspective of one of the people who participated in the events related to uh, the conflicts that El Haj Omar became involved with and his talibs or his disciples in the, uh, again, in, in the, in the uh, early to mid 19th century. And so this is, this is a really interesting poem. Uh, it's published and it's translated into English in the archive of the Umarian Tijani along with other uh, narratives, eyewitness accounts of the life of El Haj Omar Tal from, from the 19th century. So there were a number of witnesses who uh, saw uh, the, the actions of Tal, who some who participated in, um, in, in the army of Tal, and, uh, and some who were French who were hostile to Tal. And so this book, which is of about 500 pages, uh, includes many of these different uh, encounters. Now, as we look at what Tiam has to say in his epic poem uh, or ode to the life of El Haj Omar Tal, I call it an epic because it's essentially a war poem as well, but, you know, much, much like the Homeric epics. Uh, but uh, there, there, there are many other uh, volumes here or, or many other uh, accounts here of the life of El Haj Omar Tal, but we're only, we're only uh, discussing one of them. The, which I think is, is the most important of the accounts. And uh, uh, it's also, um, but I'll also bring in some selections from other uh, accounts to help supplement in places where uh, Tiam's narrative is, is relatively silent about what took place. But mostly our goal here is, is to focus on this, uh, on this important literary work uh, from West Africa, written in Ajame, as we'll discuss. Now, as you can see here, uh, the first editor and translator of this text was a, a very interesting man named Henry Gadden, who lived a good part of his life in West Africa, in Senegal. He uh, took the Casada of, um, of Tiam, which again is a laudatory, elegiac poem, which is essentially an Arabic genre uh, it, has, it has very strict rules, uh, but it's it's interesting that um, that although it's an Arabic genre, when Tiam wrote this uh, this uh, Kasada, uh, he he wrote it not in Arabic but in uh, in, in Pular, and uh, and so this was it took him a long time to write it, more than twenty years, and part of the reason why it took him so long to compose it was uh, because he, he subordinated the Ajami Arabic, or excuse me, the Ajami Pular to the, uh, to the rules of, of a different language. And so Ajami is not, I mean, it's, it's, it's an African written language. It's alphabetized with an Arabic script. So the script is Arabic, but the language itself is an African language. Um, this poem, like other kasadas, is uh, uh, meant to be performed orally, so it's an oral performative piece, much like the uh, the griot epics to Sunjata Keita or uh, Askia Muhammad. So it's it's per, it's a performative uh, genre. There are other kasadas, Ajami kasadas, in uh, plenty in Senegal. Uh, many written by, for instance. Uh, 
uh, Amadou Bamba of the Muradia order. But in this case, we're looking at a Tijani Pular epic, and it celebrates the life of El Haj Omar from the perspective of, of, of a figure who, or, or a disciple, a Talib, who, who really uh, admired El Haj Omar a great deal and held him in awe. Um, and so again, it's called The Life of El Haj Omar, a Pular Kasada. The, the translation that Gadden did was published in 1936. He translated it into French. He also included the uh, the Pular version with a uh, with a nice dictionary at the back uh, of, of translations of terms from the Pular. So he did he did it. He made a really outstanding uh, contribution in his, pres his translation, preservation, editing of this document, which he performed with great care. Uh, and again, he was quite an interesting figure. Uh, there's a Wikipedia page on him. You can look him up and find out more about him. He did many other important things as well. Um, now, I mentioned, uh, again, that it, this is an Ajame manuscript, and uh, recently uh, Ajame uh, has, has risen to more prominence. Uh, people in the United States, for instance, have become more aware of it, thanks to the contributions of Falunagom, who you see there, Boston University, who heads the Ajame Project, with his uh, director of his team, in, uh, in Senegal, Able Diakate, who have done an amazing amount of work gathering uh, Ajame manuscripts, digitalizing them, and uh, in some cases translating them, although there were far too many uh, uh, to translate for one or two people. Uh, but you can go to the Boston Uni uh, University Ajame website and you can see some of these manuscripts that they've gathered and what they look like. I just took one uh, sample here that you can uh, have, a, have a look at, but you can see um, many of the languages uh, uh, are, are, um, that have been, uh, uh, have been alphabetized in Ajame include uh, Wolof, Pular, Mande, uh, Swaninke. Uh, there's quite a lot of Wolof Ajame that, uh, that uh, uh, Faluna Gom and Able Diakate have gathered, but there's quite a lot of Pular Ajame as well. So it's, it's a very interesting and exciting uh, literature that has just sort of come on the radar screen of a lot of scholars in the United States. This is this is not one of the ones that they gathered, but it does fall within the category of, of the kind of research that they're doing and that uh, Gadden did in his translation work uh, back in uh, the, the 30s, 1930s. Now, uh, El Hajo Martal, uh, now I note here uh, his name can sometimes is spelled in English language uh, literature, T-A-A-L, some, in, in a lot of the French literature, it's T-A-L-L, um, and uh, but uh, same same figure, and he's often popularly referred to as just El Haj Omar. Sometimes the his uh, Talibs called him the Sheikh. Uh, he lived in uh, it's from 1794 or five. There's not there's some uh, question about which exact year, but but he died in 1864. He was born in Pordor in Alawar, Senegal. Porto area of the Futa Torah in Senegal. He died in Digambari, uh, in, in Dogon country, in, uh, in central Mali. Now, he was himself a uh, Pular uh, as well. Uh, now, in the case of uh, Mamadou Tiam, just a few facts about the author of this Kasada that we're going to be taking a look at. He was born in, Her in Harry uh, Podor in uh, 1830 around. Uh, he was Tukuler himself, Pul. We'll uh, also dis uh, discuss how there, there are other Fulani or Pul. Sometimes in the scholarship, the Pul are called Fulani. Sometimes they're called Pul. But there are the, the Tukuler Pul, the, the uh, Messina Pul, and there's also the uh, Pul from Sokoto. So there are different, there are different um, uh, uh, varieties of, of Fulani depending upon the region of West Africa that we're talking about. But in this case, we're talking about uh, the Tukuler pool, this is a term that the French, uh, a, a name that the French gave the pool in this uh, part of West Africa. Uh, and uh, he was uh, in the, from the same region that El Haj Omar Tal was from, from Podor. He, he became a disciple of El Haj Omar in 1846. This would have been after El Haj Omar returned from his uh, from his uh, Hajj to Mecca and in, in the Futa Jalan. He was a Talib 
or a, a student of El Haj Omar and also a foot soldier. He, his own description of himself, he describes himself as a, a small twig in El Haj Omar's mighty broom that swept clean the region of heathenism. He remained with El Haj Omar's army until 1890 in Segu. At that time, he returned to the Futa Torah with his Casada that he was still in progress. He was about uh, 60 at that time. He, uh, uh, and uh, he came to the back, essentially to the land of his birth. He gradually grew blind uh, and he uh, uh, died in 1911 when he was completely blind. And it was, again, Gadden who uh, took his Casada and made it available to the non-Pular-speaking um, world. Here is a map that can show you uh, the, the regions that we'll be talking about. Uh, you can see there the empire of El Haj Omar Tal and some of the main places that, uh, to, to, that we'll be, need to be aware of as we go through this material, looking closely at this poem. Now, you see there at the top of the map in the Futa Toro, this was the area that El Haj Omar Tal was born in, in the Podor al area, right on the border of Senegal and Mauritania. This is also the area that the French called Saint Louis when they colonized West Africa. And this was the place where they began their colonization efforts, which was going to be part of what led El Haj Omar Tal to getting into a conflict with the French. And part of why he's seen as somebody who was a uh, who, who resisted colonization because he did not want to live in, in a region that was um, under French hegemony. But his, his main area where he grew up was the Futa Torah. Now, the Futa Jalan, which you see down below the Futa Torah, this is where he first began to establish his uh, built in, in the city of Dingare, which you can see there on, on the map, uh, was where it was the first city where he. Uh, built and brought his talibs prior to the launching of his jihad. But he moved out of the Senegal area, out of the Futa Torah, out of the Futa Jalan, into what is today Mali, in part because he wanted to get away from, uh, from the French. He did not want to be under the control of the French. But this brought him into conflict with the, uh, the Bambara kingdom in Segu, and it also brought him into conflict with the Messina Fulani and Hamdalai. And, uh, and, and we'll be uh, looking at how these conflicts uh, developed and, and, what, and what the reason for them was. But at, at the apex of his, uh, of his success, he had colonized an enormous uh, amount of, uh, or he had colonized or taken over, taken control of an enormous amount of, of uh, territory in what is today the Sahel zone including uh, Timbuktu to, to the far north. And so he, he, uh, he was very successful in, uh, in, in conquering a great amount of land while his empire lasted. Um, here's another map which can show you some of the main uh, cities, towns, villages that, uh, that we'll be discussing. And I'll bring this map back from time to time so you can look at it and see where, where we're talking about. But you can see there, if you look on this map, you can see Alwar on the map. You can see uh, Saint Louis up there in the Podor area. Uh, this is again the area where he was born. And in Saint Louis, this is where the French established, first established their uh, their, their uh, stronghold there off the, uh, off, uh, on an island off of Saint Louis where they built their forts and began the process of, of colonization, which El Haj Omar uh, fiercely resisted. And then if you look down below, you can see Dingare. This, Dingare, this is where he uh, built his, uh, his uh, first village. Okay, now in, in West Africa, there are a number of different uh, Sufi brotherhoods. This is a region of Africa, uh, of, of the Islamic world, that is uh, very influenced by Sufism, but there are different Sufi orders. Now there, there are more than these, but these are three of the, the, the biggest, most important orders in the Sahel. The Kadria is, is the oldest of the Sufi brotherhoods. It was there prior to El Haj Omar becoming a member of the Tijani order and bringing the Tijani order to, uh, to the Sahel. 
uh, El Haj Omar's uh, parents. His, his father was a member of the Kadria, as were many people in this part of, of Senegal. Now there you can see Sekou Amadou. Uh, he was a Messina Fulani who was also Kadria. Mohamed Bello was Kadria. There, there, were, there were many, many uh, Kadria, and it was by far the oldest and most established order. Uh, El Haj Omar is responsible, as I said, for bringing uh, the Tijani order to uh, West Africa uh, in the uh, in the mid 19th century, and uh, Amadou Bamba of the Muradia, which this is the name of the order that he founded in Senegal, would have been in the late 19th century, early 20th century, in the aftermath of the uh, of the Tijani movement in Senegal. If you to, if you go to Senegal today, the Tijani uh, Tijania and the Muradia, these are the two. Uh, largest orders, and they uh, shape in a very profound way the cultural life and the religious life of the people that live in this part of West Africa. Now, there, there are different orders. We won't get into too deeply into the differences and the religious uh, interpretations of Islam of these different orders uh, in, in this particular uh, lecture, but we need to be aware of these differences. And Tal is the, uh, again, is associated with the Tijaniya, and that's what we're going to be discussing is the Tijaniya. And as we're going to see, the Tijaniya came into conflict with the Kadria. Um, okay, now this, this is a photograph that I took in Alawar uh, a number of years ago. Uh, these are the direct ancestors. The man in, in the blue on the left is the a direct ancestor of El Haj Omar on the far right is his son, that's Mamadou Tall, and his son Omar Tall on the far right in uh, in Alwar, in the, in the Podor area, again by the border of, of Mauritania. And they are today the guardians of the birthplace of El Haj Omar Tall. Now, the, the Fulani are, are, are a very uh, interesting uh, ethnic group uh, in West Africa. They're sometimes referred to as the Black Arabs of the Sahel. There are a lot of different stories about the Fulani's origins uh, that, that are some of them are legendary. The scholars, uh, 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 African and non-African alike, have long speculated and debated about the Fulani's origins and have written on this. Uh, some, in some accounts, they uh, are said to have married uh, the uncles of the, uh, of, of the Prophet Muhammad were said to have married local women and they came from this uh, background. Others uh, have even speculated that the word Pular is related to Phil, Phil, Fal, 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 Palestine, that they have a Palestinian origin, uh, a Syrian origin. There, there are many different stories. Now, back in 2008, I asked Mama Dutal his where, what he, where he thought uh, the Fulani came from, what their origins were, were and this is what he said to me. Um, he said, uh, history uh, tells us that the Pular came from Syria. Before that, as Islam teaches, the prophet Abraham had a wife named uh, Shara or Sarah. She became old and she had problems with Abraham. When they arrived at Misra or Egypt, the Pharaoh was already there. The Pharaoh represents the president of the Republic. Once in Egypt, formerly known as Misra, the Pharaoh wanted to commit adultery with Shara or Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Thanks to the divine power of Shara the, or Sarah, the Pharaoh never reached his goal because there was always an obstacle between them. In the long run, he realized that there must be something mysterious in the lady. Thus, the Pharaoh asked the lady what, was, what the purpose of her visit to Egypt was. The lady told him that she was uh, with a wise man who was camped nearby. Now, let me uh, note here, this is, this is a very famous story that in all of the Abrahamic traditions of Abraham and, uh, and Sarah, and, uh, and of course, in the Judeo-Christian traditions, uh, many of the prophets trace their lineage back to Abraham through his son Isaac. But in the Islamic tradition, uh, Muhammad traces his lineage to Abraham through Abraham's oldest son, Ishmael. Uh, and this story is, uh, is, is linked to that, the story that, that uh, Mamadou Tal uh, was uh, telling me this day. He said, he introducing himself to the Pharaoh, they gave him a girl named Hajar, or this is Hajar Hagar, 
uh, as a reward. When they left to go back to Syria, it was over there that Sarah ordered Abraham to marry Hagar. Uh, then he had a son with Hagar and Ishmael. Owing to the divine order, as well as jealousy and quarrels between the two women, God ordered Abraham to bring Hagar, Hagar and her son to Mecca. This is the uh, very famous story of the founding of, of Mecca, uh, when, when Hagar and Ishmael go to uh, this, this uh, forlorn site, and a city is uh, founded there when the well of Zamzam is discovered. He, okay, let me continue. He, uh, Abraham deposited Hagar and their son where the Kaaba, or the black stone, the cube, is located. Uh, there was another caravan that passed that was called Bani Zuram. They were Arabs. They had herds and they found a pasture where they could stay. There was also a version that says that Hajar was a Pular because when the Egyptians passed, they already spoke Pul. All right, so I, would, I, wanted, I wanted to bring in this story to bear. Now, this is not in Tiam's uh, uh, Kasada. Um, however, it's an interesting story because it shows that the, that the uh, Fulani themselves, like Mamadou Tal, in this case, the grandson of Al-Hajj Omar, um, conceptualize their own uh, uh, ethnic identity as coming, as being, you know, part, you know, I, I've said the Fulani are sometimes described as the black Arabs, the, the great Fulani writer Amadou Ampate Ba uh, would say, it was known to say, quoting a very famous proverb that so we, are, we are a black stream in a land of white water, a white stream in a land of black water, which is to say when, when the Fulani are among Arabs, they're thought of as black, and when they're among blacks, they're thought of as Arabs. But in any case, their, their identity is, is a mixed identity, and, and the way that uh, Mamadou Tal thinks of it is um, that, they, that, they're, uh, that they're Egyptian, uh, African insofar as they come from the lineage of Hagar, and they are Arab. Uh, insofar as they come from the lineage of Abraham. And so Abraham, you know, who, who originally was from Ur, or what would today be the modern day uh, Baghdad, uh, Iraq area, who came in to the promised land of Palestine, was a man of, of in this sense, we think of popularly as Arab origin, whereas Hagar was an Egypt, a black African Egyptian woman. And so the, the union of, of uh of Hagar and Abraham produced Ishmael, and they traced their lineage uh, in that uh, fashion. Okay, now uh, here you can see uh, the, the the Fulani in, uh, in in the various places that you'll find them in West Africa. There's the Futa Torah where Al Hajjo Martal and, and and Mamadou Tiam, the author of the Kasada, is from the Futa Jalan in Dingare, where where uh, Tal first established his, the first city that he built where his Talibs fortified themselves prior to launching the Jihad. Uh, the Messina area where the Kabdria, Messina, Fulani uh, are in the empire established by Seku Amadou was and where later Tal will come into with his Talibs. And then the Sokoto area of uh, Muhammad Bello. Who was the who who uh, was the leader in that part of what is today northern Nigeria? Um, so now the Fulani, uh, in, in in the way in the same way that the Toreg are associated with camels, the Fulani are often associated with cattle. Uh, they uh, are they, they're cow, cattle herders, cowboys in effect, and so a lot of the places where they lived were determined by. Uh, you know, lands that were favorable to the raising of, of cattle. And they you know, are often associated with, with milk, uh, with, uh, with the selling of milk and the selling of cattle, much in the same way the Tuareg are associated with the, uh, with the camel. They're, they were, con uh, the way that uh, El Haj Sekutal once uh, put this when, in a conversation that I had with him a number of years ago, was he said that you know we we were we were uh, assigned the task of uh, taking care of, of the cattle, that was our uh, job, and and of course many many of the uh, of the Fulani uh, love their cattle, uh, their cows very 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 much, and they care for them very much, uh, and they have this very close relationship with uh, cattle. Okay, now here is a uh, uh, the. Uh, the mosque in the town of Alwar, where Al Haj Omar Tal was was uh, born. This is a Tijani mosque. You can see there the adobe 
uh, mud architecture, much like the architecture of central Mali. Uh, this part of Senegal, the Poto area, is, is very similar to uh, the culture of Mali in, in terms of its architecture and the way that uh, the buildings uh, are, are built, the way that even the way that the people uh, dress and so on. Uh, this uh, this uh, mosque does not look like this today. It's been, in order to preserve it, it's been, uh, it's been fortified, uh, but this is how it looked in 2008. Here is a more uh, elaborate mosque in, in Dakar these are very traditional. This is traditionally what the Tijani mosques look like that you'll see throughout Senegal. You can see here, this is a mosque in Dakar uh, overlooking the, um, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, they're, they're very striking uh, mosques that have this design. You'll, you'll see this uh, commonly throughout Senegal, especially. Um, okay, so the, the, the conflict that we're going to discuss that, uh, that Tiam got himself involved with when he joined El Haj Omar Tal on his jihad, I, I just wanted to note, if you look at the dates of the conflict of the civil war in Mali that took place between the Tukuler Fulani and the Messina Fulani, uh, it happened you know, almost at the exact same time as the American Civil War. So at the, at the precise moment that in the United States, there's a terrible war happening that is a war of brother killing brother. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very similar situation in, in Mali, and it was uh, very tragic for many, uh, much like in the American Civil War, in which uh, you know oftentimes people in the same family found themselves on different sides of the divide. The same kind of thing happened in, uh, in, in this civil war as well, which, ha which had this very tragic dimension to it. Um, now in the case of the war in West Africa, uh, it's perhaps more accurate to call it a sectarian war uh, because it did involve matters of religious uh, differences between the leaders, the, the dynamic leaders of these different groups. Now you can see on one side, the Messina Pole or the Messina Fulani, they were Kadria. They belong to this, this much older, more established Sufi brotherhood. Um, at, at the time of the conflict, Amadou Amadou was their uh, leader. Now, Amadou Amadou was, was the son of Sekou Amadou, who had established the empire. And, and El Haj Omar, even uh, prior to the conflict that he got into with Amadou Amadou, also got into a conflict with Sekou Amadou. Now, in the case of the of the Messina, they were located. The capital of their empire was located in Hamdalai, whereas the Tukuler Pool Fulani were from what is today mostly Senegal and Guinea part of uh, the, of, of the Sahel. They were Tijani, recent converts to the Tijani order that Tal brought uh, with him after his Hajj to Mecca, in which he. Convert, initiated many people into this new order. Um, they were led by El Haj Omar Tal, uh, and they came, as I said, from the Futa Tor, the Futa Jalam in Senegal, whereas again, the Messina Pole will be located in what is today central Mali. So these were the two sides that, were, uh, that fought each other in this conflict, but both were Fulani. So again, effectively, it was cousin killing cousin, brother killing brother, uh, but they belonged to different, they were both Muslims, but they belonged to different uh, Sufi orders, Sufi brotherhoods, and they came from different regions within the Sahel. Uh, and, and, and the, the Tukuler, El Haj Omar Tal and his fathers were, were in part motivated to leave their ancestral homelands in, because of French colonization, but, and that's brought them into uh, areas that had not traditionally belonged to them. Okay, now here is the invocation from Tiam's Kasada. He says, among those whom Allah loved, there was a brilliant and luminous ram who came to live among us. This ram came to restore religion and all its true features. He accomplished this task in every possible way. This ram was vigorous, glorious, and prestigious. He spoke with a clear voice. He was a white ram with black flecks. He was a tireless ram who never stumbled. Now, uh, here, Tiam is not talking about El Haj Omar Tal. He's talking about uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Tijani, who is the founder 
of the order. Now you can see here. Now he he you know Tal um, uh, Umar Tal never really met uh, Sheikh Ahmed Al Tijani, uh, but he but the order was founded by Tijani, and he he learned it uh, the secrets of the order from a disciple of Al Tijani named. Uh, Muhammad al Ghali. But uh, Ahmed al Tijani lived from 1735 to 1815. Uh, he, is, he, he was a Maghribian Berber Muslim. He is buried today in Fez, Morocco, in one of the more interesting mosques that are there. His tomb is there. Um, often the Tijani of, of West Africa, the Fulani, for instance, who, who belong to the Tijani order and, uh, and other ethnic groups who belong to the Tijani order from West Africa. When they go to Mecca on the Hajj, they'll first stop in Fez, Morocco and visit the tomb of, of Ahmed al-Tijani that is there as part of the Hajj to Mecca. So this the Fez, Morocco is often host to uh, these to black Muslims who come to pay their respects to uh, Ahmed Al Tijani uh, in uh, in Fez. Um, okay, so let's continue with uh, the the Kasada. Among the Talibs of Al Tijani, there was a man who journeyed to the Sheikh from afar. Right, this is El Haj Omar Tal. This man came to him from the west. He came from the Futa Torah. This was a man whose strength never failed him. He came to the Sheikh from the village of Alawar, the place of his birth. Because he, uh, al Haj Omar, was born in Alwar, the greatest of blessings came to be bestowed upon our Futa. This is again uh, uh, Tian speaking. The divine light that has, that has been cast upon this town will never grow dim. We speak, of course, of Umar from the Futa, the son of Saidu, and our Sokna Adama, the purified and unsullied one. He's speaking here, the purified and unsullied one is the mother of Al Haj Omar Tal, uh, who uh, so Sokna Adama, who is a legendary figure, who was who was noted for her piety, and is still today celebrated for being such a, a pious and upstanding woman. And in this sense, Al Haj Omar is uh, was was uh, was blessed to have a mother who was such a, 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 a fine woman that is still admired today. Uh, by by Tijani throughout the region. Okay, now, um, so you can see here on this map, this this shows you Morocco up in the north, uh, Senegal down down uh, below the Sahara uh, uh, to the uh, south, and so I'm I note this to show you that that uh, the T, the Tijani order, although it began in the Maghreb, began Algeria Morocco area, it didn't come to Senegal. Uh, north to south. Again, remember the Sahara is always a kind of a formidable obstacle, but it came via, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sheikh's, uh, Sheikh El Haj Omar's pilgrimage to Mecca, and then he brought it back with them. Now, this was very common, you know, Mecca, when, when people took the Hajj in those days, especially, say, in the days prior to the invention of the airplane, modern transportation, uh, it, it was often was it took many many years to accomplish, and so when they arrived in Mecca, they would often stay for for a long time, a couple of years, for instance, and they would learn a lot. And so, in this way, the teachings of of many places, many cultures throughout the Islamic world came to be uh, disseminated uh, in, in a very wide, far ranging sense. So um, here is an image of the birthplace of El Haj Omar in Al Awar. Uh, it's right behind these men. You can see the door to the place where he was born uh, in, uh, in in Podor on the border of Senegal and Mauritania. Uh, here's here's uh, Tiam's reference to Koda Adama. Uh, this is this was the name that was given to El Haj Omar Tal, which means Adama's last born son. And uh, Tiam celebrates uh, uh, Sokna Adama, as do many people today in, uh, in Alawar and elsewhere in, in the uh, world influenced by Al-Haj Martal. Here, let's, let's read. He says, in her obedience to Allah, his mother Sokna Adama handed over all worldly affairs to the care of her husband, Tierno. She was a docile woman. She completely submitted to him in all things and never acted in anger. In body and spirit, she basked in religion's full light. She was the ointment in the musk. She was the perfume with the sweet odor, 
that never dissipates. Okay, now, uh, so he grew up in, uh, in Alwar, and there are many uh, legendary stories about miracles that he performed that are told by griots. Some are uh, maybe a little bit fabricated, but, uh, but he was certainly recognized from a, a very young age as having an extraordinary uh, intelligence, and being a very quick learner. And he, uh, El Haj Omar, in addition to being a jihadist, was also a, a writer of many, many books. He was an incredibly literate, uh, intelligent, sophisticated person. Uh, and and uh, his uh, intelligence is, is a matter of, of legend, even you know, today. Um, and for instance, stories were told that he would often ask questions to his teachers and they uh, simply didn't know how to answer him. And they even in some cases grew intimidated by him, even when he was a small child. All right. So uh, Tiam tells us that when he was when El Haj Omar was 18, uh, he made preparations to enter into combat with all that was intractable within his soul. He girded up his loins and looked deep within himself. The time had come to wage war against Iblis. This is the, an Islamic name for Satan and all the devils of the evil one. He fought against earthly pleasures, against his own bad habits and the creature comforts of daily existence. He eschewed the false friends that held him back. All those things that had impeded his development, he now rejected. He gave up everything and took refuge in Allah alone. And so, again, this, this is a lecture that is intended for people who aren't uh, very familiar with Islam. So I say here it was the greater jihad because uh, in, in the Islamic tradition, uh, there's, there's a belief that, there's always, there, that there is an esoteric and an exoteric uh, interpretation of, of all of the surahs in the Quran and all of the, the important theological concepts that we find in the Islamic tradition. And so in the case of jihad, jihad is, you know, is the war, the fight to expel the infidel. But there's the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. Now, the, the, the lesser jihad is the actual military militant struggle. Uh, the greater jihad uh, is, is the fighting uh, to, to purify oneself. It's, it's, a, it's a look, a retreat inward to, um, to, to, uh, to fight away all of the the uh, bad things within oneself. And so al Haj Omar, as a very young man, took this greater jihad, purified himself, and uh, became uh, very well known as a, as a teacher. He uh, uh, gathered many young students. And it was, in fact, it was his students when he taught them uh, the Quran who, uh, who raised the money to finance his jihad to Mecca. Here is, is one of the very few photographs that we have of El Haj Omar. This is him as, as a young man uh, on prior to his uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, okay, when he reached the age of 33 years old, El Haj Omar began to make preparations to undertake the Hajj. Embarking on the road in the service of Allah, the Sheikh traveled through diverse Muslim lands, Tiam tells us. He also traveled through many frightening heathen lands. These were kingdoms that were filled with evildoers who refused to convert to the faith. He traveled from the Futa Torah to Bandu and then from the Futa Jalan to Kangari, Kong, and Hausaland. He journeyed on the path of the religion that never grows old. He spent seven months in Sokoto before he left these lands. So now here's, here's a, a map of if we were to look where at uh, West Africa today, where the Sokoto Caliphate would have been that was ruled by Mohammed Bello, who lived from 1781 to 1837. Uh, this is a image of, of, of Bello, uh, according to a description of Hugh Clapperton, the British traveler who came to Sokoto to negotiate with Bello and into the slave trade. Uh, and uh, uh, Tal al Haj Omar stayed there for some time, and he uh, even uh, was married one of the daughters of uh, Bello and had a couple of children uh, from this daughter. Uh, one of them was uh, Medina, the, uh, his oldest child was a girl who he brought to Mecca with him but also his son Amadou, who became an important figure later in, uh, in, in, the, in the wars that took place in central Mali. 
Um, so he, you know, again, he stayed for a long time. These, this, this, the, the Hajj to Mecca was a very arduous, time-consuming journey, and uh, oftentimes there were there were lengthy intervals in between. And he, uh, so he traveled, you know, through, uh, like, say, Kong, which would be in uh, northern Cote d'Ivoire. This remains today an important uh, Islamic center, and through Sokoto, and then up and over into Egypt and in, into Mecca. And so when he arrived in Mecca, uh, Tiam tells us, upon his arrival, he walked the circumference of the Kaaba seven times, the black stone. Then he went to Safa and to Marwa. He performed all the mandatory rites that are shrouded in mystery. He stopped to pray at the site where our father Abraham once prayed, which would be the, uh, the, 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 the altar built by Abraham and Ishmael in Mecca. He stopped to imbibe the odor of the black stone and to drink deeply from the well of Zamzam. Now, again, the well of Zamzam is the well that, that Hagar or Hajar uh, discovers uh, in when, when she looks at her dying son, Ishmael, and he's dying of thirst. She's dying of thirst and she begins to weep and she sees a well springing up from, from the ground. The angel Gabriel standing at, at the feet of this well at, uh, of, of uh, where uh, Ishmael is. And uh, they decide to stay there because there's water that they can survive. And then, and then the city of Mecca is built around this well. And today, pilgrims, when they go to Mecca, will not only um, walk around the black uh, Kaaba, black stone at the Kaaba, but the, the, the altar built by Abraham and Ishmael, but they'll also drink from the well of Zamzam. And so El Haj Omar did these things as well. He and his companions, one of whom was his brother, Alup, uh, visited holy places until they were satisfied that they had seen everything they needed to see. And so here you can see uh, the Kaaba in Mecca. Now in one corner of the Kaaba is the black stone, which was laid by Abraham and Ishmael. Uh, and so, and the rest of the Kaaba is built around that stone. Uh, prior to the modern era where so many pilgrims come to, uh, to Mecca, um, you, would, uh, you would kiss the stone. Today that's not you know, practical because there are so many people there. Uh, and so sometimes you just you just gesture to it as you're walking around it. Uh, and then here you also see pilgrims during the Hajj drinking from the well of Zamzam that was discovered by Hagar, Hajar at the same uh, site. These are things that uh, Hajj Omar did on his uh, pilgrimage. Okay, now, when, but when he arrived, he found his great disappointment uh, that Sheikh Sidi Ahmed al-Tijani uh, had already died. Now note, he's disappointed because he, he did learn first about the Tijani order in uh, when he was in Senegal. Like I said, there, there, it, was, it was Tall that really brought the order to West Africa, but, but it was, the teaching was already there. It just was not very well known. It was very obscure. And so he had already been initiated into many secrets of the Tijani, and he really looked forward to meeting Ahmed El-Tijani, but uh, he, had, he had died uh, previously, something like seven years before El Haj Omar arrived in Mecca. So he learned that Sheikh Sidi Ahmed Al Tijani had died before his arrival in Mecca. But Sheikh Al Tijani had appointed one of his talibs or his disciples to serve as his caliph, a man who was near to his heart and who had inherited endless benefits from him. When the time came, Sheikh Umar was finally able to meet the heir of Sheikh Al Tijani at the house of Allah, the Kaaba of Mecca. It was there that they first greeted one another. It was there that they basked in each other's sweet smell. So Muhammad Al Ghali, uh, Tijani was not there. Al Tijani was not there, but Muhammad Al Ghali was there, and uh, Sheikh Umar entered into the service of Ahmed Al Ghali, became his companion for two or three years where he was slowly initiated into the secrets of the order by Al Ghali. Um, but uh, as Tiam tells us, it was Abdul Karim of Timbo in Senegal area who first uh, initiated the Sheikh into the uh, secrets of the order, but not all of the secrets, just the main you know, words or what it were, the litanies. These are the, the, the repeated 
uh, prayers. Uh, the Sheikh found here that he had already embraced the best of all words or litanies in his own land. He had embraced a highly celebrated word with endless advantages. He embraced this word even before he undertook his Hajj to Mecca. Abdul Karim of Timbo, a Talib of Sheikh Al Murtada, had initiated him into this word. Okay, now, uh, so let's let's note here. This this is a really important point because even in many in, in West Africa today, in Mali, for instance, there are many uh, griot uh, stories about Al Hajj Omar that are spread very widely in the region. And, and part of the, the, the pride that one has in El Haj Omar is, is that he was, you know, again, uh, uh, Fulani, and, and when they're in the Arab world, are often perceived as black, and we're in the, when they're in the black world, they're often perceived as Arab. And so, uh, when he, you know, uh, as a result, many Fulani have experienced racial uh, discrimination, racism, which, which exists in, uh, in Africa and the Arab world as it does in the United States. And so uh, the fact that he goes to Mecca and is already, uh, you know, very uh, learned because of what the, the knowledge that he acquired uh, in uh, West Africa is a source of great pride even today among many uh, Tijani uh, Muslims who live in Mali and Senegal and elsewhere in, in the Sahel. Um, okay, so we're told the, uh, that the man of discernment left the Kaaba and followed in the steps of Muhammad al Ghali. They traveled together until they came to Dabata. Now, this is this is the word that he uses for Medina, which is which was the city of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, where uh, Muhammad is buried today, and where he lived a good part of his adult life prior to his triumphant taking of, of Mecca after many years of conflict between Mecca and uh, Medina. And so, so after being in Mecca. Uh, El Haj Omar journeys with Al Ghali to uh, to Medina, where they sought to obtain the eternal baraka or blessings from a descendant of Hashem. This would be the Prophet Muhammad. When they arrived at Medina, they stopped to greet the man who, in life, had surpassed all others. They pressed their faces upon the ground in the garden of no worries. They smelled the sweet smell of its rich dirt. I want to note here that they are traveling to visit the tomb of the prophet uh, Muhammad. Now here's a, a, an early uh, image photograph of this tomb. You can see where Mecca is on the map uh, and, and Medina or Dabata as it's being referred to in this poem. And I note this, that El Hajj prays at the tomb of the prophet because this, this was about, now at this time, the, the Wahhabiyah who are, uh, uh, very, uh, who, who have a very strict interpretation of the Quran, um, they are against the idea of praying uh, at tombs. They, they, they live, they have a great anxiety that people are turning the prophet into a kind of a deity. And so they're famous for their, their, their iconoclastic tomb smashing. And they are, in effect, tomb smashers. Uh, but I, I note this because El Haj Omar. Uh, was not a tomb smasher. He was not, he was certain, the Tijani order is, a, the, the, he became, he was a jihadist, but he was a jihadist who was a, um, a Sufi as well. And so many of the religious practices that he embraced are are, are, are African, or they, they have an African cultural origin. And, and the Sufi tradition, as it's practiced in West Africa, it's very common to pray at the tombs of the prophets and the Wahhabiyah who were just uh, beginning to take steam at this time because they emerged in the 19th century were very opposed to to this practice and so if we look for instance here at an image of, of a tomb in Timbuktu that was smashed by many of the Wahhabi who invaded that part of Mali in 2012 uh, they they uh, were again iconoclastic icon smashing they, they destroyed many of these tombs, which have today been uh, rebuilt. But El Haj Omar was an African man, and he prayed at the tomb of the prophet. In fact, uh, he received many of the most important teachings from uh, Al Ghali at the tomb of the prophet, or he was initiated into many of the secrets of the order when he was standing at the tomb of the prophet Muhammad and praying at the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad served as a witness to the oaths that he swore 
on that particular tomb. This would this is again a watershed issue that makes the the, the Tijaniya interpretation of Islam very different from the Wahhabi interpretation and the interpretation of say uh, militant groups like ISIS uh, and um, Al Qaeda and so on who were more Wahhabi in their orientation. Okay. Um, the the uh, Al-Hajj Omar and Muhammad Al-Ghali also extended their pilgrimage by taking trips to uh, Al-Quds or, or Jerusalem and other holy sites in, in the region uh, beyond Mecca. Uh, we're told the man of discernment and those who accompanied him now traveled upon the road to Ilya or, or Jerusalem. Uh, the, but again, the Arabic uh, name for Jerusalem is Al-Quds or the holy uh, so they came to Jerusalem as well. When they arrived, he visited the tombs of the prophets. He also saw the tombs of the companions of the prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he saw everything that he had come to see. The sheikh and his companions visited all of these holy places. Uh, Al-Hajj Omar's brother was there as well. Now his brother uh, died uh, in, uh, in Morocco on their return from uh, Mecca, but at this time his brother was with him as well in this part of the Hajj. Brother Aliu. Uh, they visited all these sacred sites and beheld many marvels and wonders. Okay, so here's one of the places they would have visited. This is the Al Aqsa or the Al Aqsa Mosque or the Dome of the Rock uh, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. There you can see the rock. This is the rock that's believed to be the rock where Abraham would have sacrificed his or was going to sacrifice his son before a ram was for, found in the thickets. This also was the place of the famous night journey when Muhammad uh, is said to visit the various the other prophets and have a discussion with him on this site. So this is one of the most holy sites uh, uh, for uh, Muslims in the world and it's located in uh, Jerusalem. They would have visited as well, we're told, Hebron, which is the tomb of the uh, prophet Abraham, his wife Sarah, his son Isaac, and Rebekah. They're all buried at this site in, uh, in, what, in Palestine, Hebron, which unfortunately today is under uh, Israeli occupation. Many of the Palestinians who have lived there for, uh, you know, forever have, have been driven out of their homes as this area has been occupied. Uh, but uh, but this uh, mosque is still there. It was in the uh, in the 1990s. This was the site of a terrible massacre when a uh, when it, when a Jewish uh, man from Chicago, a doctor, came in and killed 60 Muslims who were praying at this site. But uh, so it's it's a very uh, contested place, obviously. But on the right, you see the tomb of the prophet Abraham. Um, on the left, you see the tombs of Isaac and uh, Rebekah at the site in Hebron, which El Haj Omar visited with Muhammad al Ghali. Um, so he continued throughout the Hijaz. They journeyed to the abyssal site, abysmal site where the relatives of Lot, Abraham's nephew, were destroyed. This is a Sodom and Gomorrah. They stayed just long enough to understand what had happened in this terrible place. Then they journeyed onward. Altogether, the sheikh spent seven months in Shams in Syria. Now, remember, again, as we started, we said this is where for uh, El Haj Omar's grandson, uh, Muhammad Uttal, this is where uh, the, the, the Fulani are said to have originated. And this also links with this idea that the, that the pull, even etymologically, the word pull itself has a Palestinian origin also. Um, so, Here's on the right is a modern day image of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, on, and you can see, a, again, a painting of its destruction when the angels who visit uh, Abraham and his uh, tent uh, go on to, uh, to see Lot and they're very badly mistreated. And so as a result, uh, fire is rained down from the sky and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are uh, destroyed. All right, now after three years, uh, Muhammad al Ghali, of, of his instruction of Al Haj Omar, he has a dream. Uh, and in his dream, the Prophet Muhammad uh, visits him, but also the Sheikh al Ghali, excuse me, the Sheikh uh, Tijani visits him. And the Sheikh al Tijani says to him, Listen, my Murid Muhammadu al Ghali, the time has now come to give to Umar, Al Haj Omar, tall that is, 
of the Futa all that he seeks. You must initiate him into all aspects of the words and dickers. You must inform him of all the hidden secrets of the order. The authorization, authorization for you to do so is entirely sanctified. Let nothing bar your path from doing so at once. So uh, Sheikh Al-Tijani comes to Muhammad Al-Ghali in a dream. And uh, we're going to see as well that, uh, that Al-Hajj Omar has uh, dreams as well in which he has visitations from the Prophet Muhammad, visitations from the Sheikh Al-Tijani who, who bring to him messages. And so um, Al-Ghali has one of these dreams and, and he knows now that it's time for him to give to Al-Hajj Omar all the secrets of the order to bar, to, uh, bar he says, to, to, to hold nothing back and to tell him uh, everything that he needs to know. And so they go to the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad. He says, he brought our sheikh to the tomb of the one who surpassed all others. He, the Prophet Muhammad, will serve as their witnesses on the day of judgment, for he is the best of all witnesses. So it's interesting to note here that, that the Prophet Muhammad himself who was buried at this tomb is said to serve as a witness to the oath swearing that takes place. Again, this is a this is a very distinctly West African practice. When you read, for instance, the Tariq uh, El, El Fatash of uh, by Mahmud Khati, the, the Timbuktu Chronicles, you also find very similar beliefs about what can happen when one prays or uh, also swears an oath on the tomb. Of, of a saint or, or of a prophet, and here uh, they're at the tomb of the prophet Muhammad. We'll find this all. You find this also in the epic of of Iskia Muhammad, uh, the song Hey uh, Griot epic, where uh, Mamar Kase or the Iskia Muhammad goes to the tomb of the prophet Abraham, uh, much like El Haj Omar is doing in this uh, poem. Uh, then he spoke aloud to the prophet. Uh, this is Al Ghali. Be our witness on this day. I have ordained your Talib to take his place among all your descendants. I have bestowed upon him all the words and dickers. I have bestowed upon him the most sacred authorization of all, the Ishtakara that never grows dim. Uh, though the Sheikh had planned to stay longer at Medina, he was now ordered to return to the lands of the West, which is to say back to the Sahel, his homeland. Go and sweep these heathen lands clean, said the tireless one, who surpassed all others. Okay, just a couple of things to note here. Now, the uh, Ishtakara is, is a mystical practice that he that the Sheikh learns from Muhammad al-Ghali. And this is a matter of, it, it's, a, it's a something of an oracle, a retreat that he enters into. Uh, uh, he goes into withdraw and he prays and fasts for a number of days until he receives a divine authorization or message. So it's kind of like, it's kind of a bit like an oracle. Uh, I note this because during the, uh, the, the jihad that al Haj Omar conducted, whenever he sought guidance, he would go into retreat and receive messages. And he believed and his Talibs believed that as long as they were faithful to those messages that he received, that their jihad could not fail. And indeed, their jihad had a tremendous uh, success. Okay, so uh, note here then, uh, uh, this is a Sufi practice, but it's a Sufi practice that is that is used to facilitate uh, jihad. And so a lot of times in, in the United States, for instance, when one thinks of Sufism, one tends to think of, uh, you know, the poet Rumi or twirling dervishes and uh, one has the idea of you know, Sufism as a religion of love, and indeed it is, but uh, Sufism is also, it can be, and, and it is in this case, uh, is not necessarily, it doesn't exclude the practice of uh, jihad. And so al Haj Omar does receive the injunction to sweep these heathen lands clean. Now heathen, you could translate the word that's used also as pagan for heathen. I prefer the word heathen because it does imply this idea that, um, you know, pagan is not as in, as in you know, it's not like a, a Christian condemnation of, of, of paganism like we find, let's say, in the, in the way that Christians respond to Greek mythology, for instance. It's, it's rather, it's, it's linked to, it has an ethnic uh, uh, dimension to it in this, this term. And it is, it does, uh, it, it's, it's a pejorative term, but it does accurately describe 
how Al Haj Omar saw his task as being to uh, to convert people uh, who um, who themselves were were non-Muslim. And the Sahel is a land uh, at this time, especially that uh, there, there are a lot of people there who practice animist religious beliefs who were not Muslim and they lived together uh, with Muslims. But he saw his task. Uh, that he receives in, in Mecca as, uh, as, as bringing Islam to a, to a heathen people. Okay, he, uh, but this, even though he's given this permission in Mecca, he does not, his jihad itself is not officially authorized until he receives a, a dream about it. So it's not as if once he receives this uh, authorization in Mecca that he can start his jihad, he has to wait for further authorization, which as we'll see, he, he receives in a dream when Al Tijani appears to him. Now here is, this is an image of the, uh, of, of a retreat place that he built in al in the town of his birth upon his return from Mecca. It's still there today. Uh, the awning was placed uh, on this very recently above it in order to protect it. But it's just a small uh, little uh, room where one goes inside and he shuts the door and he prays for, for a long time until he finds the answers that he's seeking. Uh, today, uh, members of the Tijani order will come and pray at this site in, uh, in al -Wahr. Okay, uh, but Al Ghali also gave a warning to El Haj Omar. He said, "Whatever happens to you in this world and in the next is now entirely in your own hands. Listen, my Talib. Listen carefully, so you will understand. Avoid getting mixed up with the kings of this world and all those who consort with them." Right now, th this is an important uh, injunction that El Haj Omar receives, and it and it very profoundly influence how he conducted his jihad. Because even though he was given permission to conduct jihad, he was not given permission himself to become a king or to become mixed up with kings. And so as a consequence, he often would uh, conduct jihad and then, and then go from one village to the next. And then he would install a lieutenant there, but he would not himself rule as a king or as an emperor or as a sovereign, although later he will install his own son Amadou to function in that capacity. But al Haj Omar believed that it was not, uh, that he did not himself have permission to serve as a king or to even uh, get up, mixed up too deeply in politics. And so he was uh, a jihadist, but one who did not, who was, who did not believe that he was himself authorized to serve in, as a sovereign in any political sense. Okay, after he receives this uh, permission from uh, Muhammad al Ghali in, uh, in, in Mecca, after he receives the, the blessings and is initiated into the last secrets of the order, Al Haj Omar Tal goes to Cairo on his return trip. Um, and there he undergoes a kind of a, an, an exam with some of the greatest learned minds in Islam which uh, Tiam speaks about. He says, the man of discernment bid farewell to his friends at Dabata and Medina. He headed back on the road to Egypt. Now that he had come to Cairo, the great savants of the best schools gathered together. They longed to test the Sheikh Umar. They sought to fool the savant of the far west for no one could outwit him. They tested the Sheikh's understanding in all branches of the religious sciences. They refused to believe that a man from the far west was superior to them in true knowledge. The sheikh took a seat among these savants from the best schools. On all sides, proud men surrounded him. These proud men really wanted to see him stumble. He amazed them with all his learned answers, for he was a true savant. He was a master of everything he had ever read. He was a man who excelled in profundity of understanding. No matter what they asked him, he never made a single mistake. The man of discernment, who's al Haj Omar, he's often referred to in this way in this poem, now bid farewell to Egypt and headed back towards the Maghrib. He headed back to the lands of the far west, and then he turned towards his own native land, the Futa Toro. So um, this, this story of al Haj Omar's intellectual triumph in Cairo is, again, one of those stories that's often told 
in, in a griot fashion with, with plenty of embellishments in uh, West Africa, but it also is, again, it provides evidence of, of the fact that he was a, a very great mind and that also that he experienced some uh, discrimination, you know, as, as a black Muslim, no one, you know, very few ref would believe that he was as uh, uh, gifted and as intelligent and as learned as, as he was. And so these, these tales, the griot versions of these tales tell the story of, of his triumph uh, again and again. To, and this, is, this serves as a matter of, of pride and, and, and reinforcing the idea that Islam and this part of Africa was already superior or at least on a par, on, a, on an equal footing with Islam as interpreted in, in the Arab world. And Al-Hajj Omar was, uh, was uh, one of the, considered to be one of the great intellectuals of his time. All right, on his, on his return back, uh, he passed through Bornu and Sokoto once again. So he, it wasn't, he didn't go straight back to, um, to the Futa Torah. Uh, in, in Bornu, he, the, the king there, you know, now that he had been empowered in this, all of these uh, uh, mysterious ways in his pilgrimage to Mecca, he, and he had many, uh, he was a very charismatic figure. He was very, uh, you know, many people were drawn to him, but this made a lot of the, the local leaders, chiefs and uh, religious leaders, marabous, a bit uncomfortable. And when he arrived in Bornu, the, the sultan there tried to have him killed. Um, he did not succeed, and uh, just no matter how many times that he tried, and finally he himself uh, became grew fearful of El Haj Omar. Uh, El Haj Omar ended up uh, marrying one of his daughters as well, and this daughter became the mother of his son, Agibu who was a prominent figure in, uh, in, in the latter, af after the death of El Haj Omar, who ruled the, uh, the, tu the uh, Tukular Empire from uh, Bandiagara. And uh, in any case, uh, he, he, he then went on to Sokoto, where he uh, met Mohammed Bello. Once again, remember Mohammed, Mohammed Bello was this very important Muslim leader who was, who was Kadria and El Haj Omar initiated him at this time, Muhammad Bello, into many of the secrets of the Tijani order. He stayed there for, for a number of years and the two grew very uh, close together. Um, here is an image of Muhammad Bello. You can see from Sokoto, 18, he lived from 18, uh, or he ruled Sokoto, that is from 1817 to 1837. Uh, Seku Amadu, as of the Messina Empire lived from 1776 to 1845. Now, uh, Seku Amadou was the father of Amadou Amadou, who later came into conflict with El Haj Omar. But even at this time, Seku Amadou uh, was, uh, was, 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 had heard plenty of rumors about El Haj Omar, and he was not particularly uh, happy that this new order, this Tijani order, was coming into the region. He himself, like Bello, was was Kadria, and he was very suspicious uh, of El Haj Omar, and, and as it turns out, with good reason, because later El uh, Haj Omar will get into a conflict with M the Messina Fulani, although this would have been after Seku Amadou himself uh, died. But um, as we'll see, um, Seku Amadou tried to have El Haj Omar killed at this time. This would have been prior to El Haj Omar arriving back in the Futa Torah, but after his Hajj to Mecca, Seku Amadou tried to have El Haj Omar assassinated. Um, okay, uh, what uh, what Tiam says is that in Sokoto, he met El Haj Omar, met the Sultan Mohammed Bello. He found that this Sultan was a just and powerful man. He was a wise ruler who abhorred all forms of injustice. He was a river that never runs dry. The Sultan welcomed the Sheikh with true hospitality. He gave him countless gifts in deference to his great reputation. He did so because he wished to gain knowledge from him. The man of discernment dwelled with the Sultan and softened his spirit. He helped the Sultan in all matters, big and small. He did all that he could to help him for the Sultan was a wise and powerful man from a great family. He had little need to humble himself before any man. And so whereas Seku Amadou uh, was very suspicious of El Haj Omar, uh, Muhammad Bello was not. And they were both 
uh, again, Bello and Sekou Amadou were both cadre. And here was El Haj Omar coming with this new teachings, this, the teachings of the Tijani. But Bello was anxious to learn. And he had already given El Haj Omar his daughter in marriage. And they had many affinities for one another. And so El Haj Omar stayed with Bello uh, for uh, a number of years. But Bello then, you know, he, he knew or he, he sensed anyway that there, could, that there was the potential for conflict between El Haj Omar and, uh, and, and Sekou Amadou. And so he urged uh, El Haj Omar to write a book clarifying that, the, that one did not have to convert to the Tijani uh, interpretation of Islam, that the Kadria interpretation of Islam was, was just fine, um, but, uh, you know, and, and that they were, they were two, let's say, paths up the same mountain. Uh, but they uh, they didn't need to be in conflict with one another, and, and so Muhammad uh, Muhammadu Bello sensed that this would be uh, this could be a problem. So Tall complied with his request, and Tall indeed did write the book, clarifying that the cat that there was no inherent reason for the Kadria and the Tijani to come into conflict, not in any doctrinal. Uh, Islamic sense. And so the conflict that did develop later on was was more political than it was uh, doctrinal. Uh, and yet it's still, I think, accurate to describe this as a sectarian conflict, but it was but it, but it was driven by uh, politics, perhaps even more than uh, religion. OK, so here's here's an image of Amadou Tal. Uh, he lived from 1836 to 1897. His Mother was one of the uh, uh, children of, of Muhammad Bello from Sokoto, uh, and he was the oldest son of Tal, who Tal then will install as emir of Segu once the Messina area is taken over, and then will uh, try to uh, uh, install uh, Amadou in Hamdalai as well as his lieutenant. And then Agi Tal who was the youngest son of El Haj Omar, at least the one that he had the most affection for. Uh, and he and Amadou were, were at one time very close to one another. And then they too, unfortunately, came uh, in, into conflict. So these are two uh, very important figures. And as, as I said, the, the mother of A Agibu was from, from Bornu and was the daughter of the Sultan of Bornu. He lived, as you can see, from 1843 to 1907. This is what Tiam says about Amadou. He says, in Sokoto, the Arab among Arabs was born. Now note, uh, Tiam is, uh, he calls uh, Amadou Tal the Arab among Arabs. Uh, and this is interesting in, in the sense that, that with, with the, in the case of the Fulani, uh, some uh, children are, are darker in appearance, some are more Arab in appearance. Amadou was, was celebrated as, as a Arab and he was referred to as the Arab among Arabs. And, and of course, we're getting this again from this perspective of Tiam. Now, Tiam was a very pious follower of El Haj Omar. Uh, he, he, he is not critical of Amadou Tal in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he was this, this uh, Kasada was meant to be given to Amadou Tal as, as, a, uh, as, as a gift. Uh, he, I, he never was able to, to finally present it to Amadou Tal. But uh, but but Tall appears, Amadou Tall appears in very grandiose terms. Uh, in fact, the historical portrait that emerges of him in some of the other documents offers a bit more of a complex uh, uh, figure, uh, particularly in, in the accounts where he uh, seeks to, in, in some cases, does assassinate his brothers, whom he uh, perceives to be a threat to his uh, you know, rulership after the death of his father. And this is uh, one of the reasons why he and uh, Agibu Tal also came into conflict. But Tiam sees Amadou Tal through very uh, rosy eyes, we might say. Uh, so uh, this boy, he says, grew to be a great man. He grew to be a brave man who, known, who knew no fear whatsoever. This boy grew to be a man who was feared and respected by all his enemies. As the firstborn heir to Sheikh Al Mortada, this is how Tiam refers to El Hajimar. Al Mortada means the chosen one, and so he was he was the firstborn of the chosen one. Um, the Arab or Amadou obeyed his father in all things, for he inherited from his father many qualities of infinite goodness. He is a gentle saint of Allah who has performed endless acts of goodness. 
His name is Amadou al-Madini, the son of al-Murtada. He remains the gold standard among men. So uh, Tiam indeed praises Amadou Tal in very, very high terms. Uh, I'm not so sure Amadou Tal merits some of these praises, uh, but that's again a matter for the historians. We're simply studying a poem. Um, okay, after spending seven years in Sokoto with Sultan Mohammed Bello, the Sheikh made preparations to travel to the lands of the far west. He left Sokoto and journeyed until he reached the lands of the Messina, this would be the Messina Fulani of Seku Amadou. When he arrived, he stayed in the village of Hamdalai, this was the capital of the Messina Empire. In Hamdalai, Sheikh Amadou, uh, which would be uh, Seku Amadou, uh, offered hospitality to Sheikh Omar. He did, he did not do so out of any great love for him. He did so because he wanted to take measure of the Sheikh's worth. So, okay, so he, he now has been, uh, Al-Hajj Omar has now been in Sokoto. He's not yet returned to the Futa Torah um, after his Hajj. He's been in Sokoto for seven years. He and Sultan Muhammad Bella have become very close. Al-Hajj Omar has initiated so, uh, Bello into all of the secrets of the Tijani order. And uh, now he's going on to Seku Amadou, perhaps at the urging of Mohammed Bello to see if he can uh, form a kind of a detente or, or an alliance of some sort with Seku Amadou. But Seku Amadou um, is very suspicious of, of uh, Sheikh Omar, and he's very suspicious of the Tijani order. And so he uh, he's, he's, he's wants to get a sense of his worth. This is what Tiam is telling us. Um, and so here, but this is from, uh, from another uh, account taken by a, a British uh, missionary who transcribed it named uh, Reichart. I'll return to that in a bit. Uh, but here's, here's his uh, account of, of what took place. He says, Mohammed Bello asked his scribe to make a copy of the book entitled Jawhir al-Iman. Uh, and from the teaching of Sheikh Omar, Mohammed Bello adopted the tariq the principles of the order, the Tariqa, the principles of the order that had been taught by Sheikh Al Tijani. So Bello becomes, you know, himself initiated. Uh, Muhammad Bello asked Sheikh Omar to write a new book about the Kadria. This would have been uh, the the order that Sheikh Amadou would have uh, been following, as well as Bello at this time, exhorting those who belong to the orders of both the Kadria and the Tijaniya to not allow any hostile rivalries to emerge between them. This book would also make clear that it was perfectly acceptable in the eyes of God if those who belong to the Kadria were unable to adopt the Tariqa of Sheikh Al-Tijani. Sheikh Omar wrote such a book and called it the Sword of the Blessed. Okay, so uh, so so again, Bello uh, sensed that there would be that there could potentially be a conflict between these two orders, between these two leaders, um, Sheikh Amadou and Hajj Omar, and so he asked El Sheikh Omar El Omar Tal to write this book, and indeed Omar Tal wrote it, and so there is no reason for the Kadria and the Tijani to be in conflict, and this remains even so today. There's no doctrinal, really, there are no significant doctrinal differences between them that, that, that matter all that much. They're both Muslims, and they both recognize each other as legitimate Muslims. Um, so, okay, so here's, here's a map. You can see Messina there in the middle, Sokoto, where Muhammad Bala lived. Um, and, and the Futa Torah, which is the home of El Haj Omar, and the Futa Jalon, where he first established his, uh, his uh, city, Dinga, Dingare. But if you look over here on, on, on the uh, right, you can see in, the, in red there, this is the places where the, the, the Tukular Empire of El Haj Omar were later formed. And so the, this, the Empire of El Haj Omar was formed really right on, you know, he had to he had to uh, defeat the Messina to uh, forge this emperor. So it was this empire. So it was, um, you know, it was inevitable that these two men would eventually, or these two uh, groups would eventually come into conflict, and indeed they did. Although uh, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that Al Haj Omar did not see himself as needing to get into this conflict. Uh, but he did, in, in fact, get into this conflict for complicated reasons, as we'll uh, explore. Okay, now, uh, there, was, there was an Arabic manuscript that Maurice Delafosse translated in 1913 
called the historical and legendary traditions of the West Sudan. This is yet another one of these accounts of the life of El Haj Omar. And uh, I'm bringing this in here because it gives us a little bit more uh, background into the nature of the conflict between uh, Sekou Amadou and El Haj Omar at this time and what took place um, at, at prior to the, the launching of El Haj Omar's Jihad, the, the, at, at the backdrop of the tension that between the Messina Fulani and the Tukular Fulani. Um, at this time, Messina was ruled by the, by the Sultan named Ish Sheikh Amadou uh, Balobo. This is Sekou Amadou. They went to the home of this man who received them with honor, but afterwards wanted to betray and kill El Haj Omar. To do this, uh, he, Sekou Amadou, dispatched some men to hide in the brush on the path that El Haj Omar was planning to follow so they could kill him. When El Haj Omar departed, the Sultan of Messina, this would be Sekou Amadou, left with him and accompanied him at a certain distance from the capital. Then this Sultan, that is Ish Sheikh Amadou Balobo, returned to his capital after the two of them had shaken hands. However, as Ish Sheikh retraced his steps, Al Haj, this would be Al Haj Omar Tal, quit the path that he had been following up to that point and took a different way. The emissaries of Ish Sheikh returned and told him, told Sekou Amadou, that they hadn't seen anything. So Ish Sheikh dispatched a messenger to the ruler of the town of Saro to tell him to betray and kill El Haj Omar. Now, obviously, he did not succeed in, in doing this, uh, but it's, it's, it's worth noting that, that he tried. So again, here's, here's another, uh, yet another map. You can see again Sokoto and Bornu, but you can see where the empire of El Haj Omar was established. There's Messina. Uh, uh, not, you know, you can see it right below Timbuktu, um, and then Segu a little further down in Ningare. So, uh, conflict is brewing. It's, 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 it's on its way. Again, and the, the, just to review very quickly, the, the four, the, the two sides, you have the Messina pool who are Fulani, Kadria Muslims. They become led, led by Amadou Amadou, who is the son of Sekou Amadou, the man who tried to kill El Haj Omar at the Messina uh, Empire based in Hamdalai. And then on the other side of the conflict, you have the Tukuler Pool or Fulani, who are Tijaniya, led by El Haj Omar of the Futa Torah and the Futa Jalan. Here, is, here are some images of, of Segu. We're going to be talking a little bit more about this as we look at the conflict that, that uh, eventually arose. But the, but the Segu kingdom was a kingdom that uh, Sekou Amadou had already, the Messina Fulani in Hamdalai had already conquered uh, Segu and essentially had rendered Segu a vassal to their state uh, in, in the sense that the, that the, that the Bambara Segu kingdom paid taxes, in effect, to, uh, to the Messina Empire. And they, so they were effectively a vassal state. And so long as they paid taxes, they were... Uh, allowed to continue to practice animism. Uh, and, and nominally, they may have appeared to be Muslim, but but the the uh, you know the, the Messina Fulani and, and Hamdalai, you know they they were fairly tolerant of the way in which they practiced Islam, and uh, and this is we're going to see is later also going to be a source of conflict between. Uh, the Messina Fulani and the Tukular Fulani when El Haj Omar brings his jihadists into this region from the Senegal region. Uh, Henry Gadden, in one of his footnotes to Tiam's poem, says, tells us this too. He says, Sheikh Umar was imprisoned and placed in irons, or in, he was uh, held as a prisoner in Segu by the king. Uh, these actions were prompted by Sekou Amadou, uh, he says, or perhaps one or more of his sons. Uh, Sekou Amadou hoped that the king would kill this dangerously ambitious marabou whom he saw as a threat. Following the advice of one of his sisters, the king eventually let the sheikh go. Now, basically what happened was the king of Segu's uh, sister had a terrible dream and said, you know, this, this man, this marabou, he's, he's, a, he's got a lot of baraka. You better be careful. If, if, if Sekou Amadou wanted him killed, why didn't he do it? You, you know, don't, don't do his dirty work. And so uh, he, uh, even though he's a king of, of essentially a vassal state of Messina, 
uh, he, he lets the Sheikh go. And so uh, El Haj Omar is able to return safe back to his homeland in the Futa Torah. Uh, now he returns at last. Uh, and and uh, Tiam tells us that it took 20 years since he had left. He'd been gone for that long on his Hajj. Here's Tiam. He says, it was time now to journey to al the place of his birth. The Sheikh had now come full circle. From the time that he had first left on his Hajj until the day of his return, 20 years had now passed. So indeed, that's quite a long uh, Hajj. Uh, when the Sheikh's Talibs arrived in the Torah, or when the Sheikh's Talib arrived in the Toro, he proclaimed, "El Hajj Omar, Al Mortada, or the Chosen One, salutes you." He salutes you with the perfumed salute of the true religion. The pleasing odor of this perfume will never dissipate. The Sheikh has been gone for many years, taking the Hajj to Mecca. He undertook the Hajj on your behalf. In the Holy Lands, he performed all the religious rites. He walked many times around the black stone of the Kaaba. He visited the prophet's tomb at Dabata or Medina. Allah has blessed him with boundless gifts. But the Hajj considers these gifts to have been given to him on your behalf. This is why he has come home to you. And the people answered, all praises are due to Sheikh Omar. Our Haji has now returned. He is most welcomed here. Alan wassalan. For the Sheikh is a great river that never runs dry. So remember, he left at about the age of 30, and so now he's coming back, and he's 20 years later, he's 50 years old, he's received all of the secret learning, he's consolidated his knowledge and his political connections all throughout West Africa, and he's, he is ready now uh, with the, the new religion, uh, interpretation of the religion, the Tijani interpretation that he's brought with him, to begin gathering more talibs. Now he already has talibs gathered around him, but this is the time after his return where he begins to attract more and more followers. And so the, he, he's become a legendary figure. The French who are there in Saint Louis, they're, they're aware of him. Everybody is aware of this dynamic figure um, who has emerged from obscurity. And, uh, and everybody's a little bit worried about what, what he's gonna do next. So uh, he's, he's back home in Alwar, and this again is the, is the mosque that he built at this time in Alwar. And so uh, in the next lecture, we'll uh, look more at what happened after his jihad was, was, uh, uh, was, was launched. And, uh, and then we'll get uh, deeper into the third lecture. We'll look at what took place in the conflict between the Messina Fulani and the Tukulair Fulani, or between Al-Hajjah Martal and Amadou Amadou.